Hey guys, Henning and Morton from Flip Normals here. In today's video, we want to talk to you about how to become a character artist. This is one of the most requested videos we have, where we're actually just going to cover how to get started with sculpture, how to, where the end goal would really be how to get a job as a character artist. Mm. And this could be for, um, for gaming or film, whatever it might be, commercials, illustration, whatever. This is just an overall guide to how to get good at characters. Yep. So this is, this is going to be in, um, we're going to separate this into two parts. The first is going to be, well, one of the parts of learning is learning the tools. And then the second part is learning the core principles. The reason we, you really have to separate this out when you're learning is that they're, they're completely separate things. When you're learning a tool, that is a very technical thing. That is learning how ZBrush operates. It is um, the hotkeys of Maya, it's all these kind of things here. And then you have the core principles. These these never changes. They've been valid for 500 years and they're going to be valid for the next 500 years. The current version of Seabrush might be valid for like two months. Maybe there's a new version out there. Yeah. And everything you knew about the software might be completely obsolete, like, like with a plugin update. You also think about physics and anatomy is that it's pretty consistent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and topical humans have been around for like 200,000 years. So, yeah. so <laughs> unless something drastic changes, <laughs> we're good. We know it. Yeah. We're pretty good. <laughs> So the tools you, you're probably going to have to learn here are first, ZBrush. If you're a character artist, ZBrush is the go-to tool. We mm -hmm. have people asking, can I sculpt in Modo, Blender, 3D Coat? Technically, yes. Mm -hmm. Practically, no. Uh, ZBrush is, is by far the most advanced sculpting tool here. Also because it's just become, it is the industry standard. Yeah. There are obviously still places... I think, that use Mudbox. Yeah. Um, and some people prefer to use Mudbox, but the vast majority of people use ZBrush. So yeah. I would really recommend just getting into ZBrush. It's just such a good tool when it comes to sculpture. Mm. It's a weird tool, which the the UI is is terrible. Like, nothing makes sense. The naming convention for stuff is weird as hell. But, but it can sculpt. Yeah. It's there, really good for that. There's this weird dementia feature built into ZBrush, <laughs> though. So if you leave it alone for a week, you might have forgotten it. Yes. <laughs> ZBrush, it's weird because ZBrush is an amazing sculpting tool, but a terrible software. Like, it's mm. terribly designed. But it's the feeling of sculpting in ZBrush is just unmatched. Yeah. Like you can't. You go, you can't find that anywhere else. No, like when they're trying to add sculpting to Modo and all that, they have features which maybe maybe Seabrush doesn't have. There might be some cool ones here and there, but it really doesn't matter if you can't sculpt on it. If yeah. you don't have the true sculpting feeling, and that's that's one of these things you can't describe to a software engineer. Yeah, yeah but you can sculpt. It's additive or subtractive. Yeah, but look, <laughs> <laughs> it's not just about that. No, because I mean, when it when it comes down to it. Yeah, I remember in the beginning, I was like, I was crazy about all the features in ZBrush and it would go through all the brushes, which I would recommend that you do. Yes. But now it's kind of like you just, you settle on something that you know that works. Yeah. I use three, four brushes yeah. maybe. That's about yeah. it. You know, I like that's, I stick to my, my clay or clay buildup brush for 99% yeah. of the time. And then I go in with another brush occasionally. Mm. So it's, it's really just a few tools within the tool. Yeah, we have a free introduction to ZBrush on our YouTube channel as well, mm. which covers pretty much everything you need to know. It's like an hour long and um, doesn't go over any fancy tools. No, it, no. it really does, doesn't take a long time to learn technically how ZBrush operates. What takes time is learning how, it's, how to sculpt with it. It takes a bit of time learning how to use it in a pipeline, though. Yeah, that's, there, there's, <laughs> that's where it gets kind of tricky, and that's where you start to see the flaw of the software, yeah. where something like Mudbox would... It, well, it's a lot better for pipeline, yeah. um, unfortunately. Yeah. It's like if you could just marry those two. <laughs> Sculpting of ZBrush, pipeline of Mudbox. Yeah, that'd be great. Then you're good. Like, you know, what everyone, what everyone struggles with is displacement maps and smoothing of your UVs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's just something you have to get used to. And it's something you probably won't get used to until you start using it in a production. No. And, and if it comes to getting a job as well, I've never heard anyone who, they know Seabrush well, they know Maya well, but they haven't got a job because they don't know how to work with two together perfectly. That yeah, is something yeah, yeah. you learn, like, in a production. That yeah, is, and, like, some pipelines are different in different exactly. companies, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. No, not at all. Just just figure out how to get your sculpting in yeah. Seabrush. <laughs> if, if you can't afford a full, full version of Seabrush, you have Seabrush Core, which is far cheaper. Yeah. It's pretty limited in features, but... 
who cares because you just on one side you need like two brushes and you can always start out with sculptress which is mm. free just to get a feel for the sculpting yeah then maybe move up to zbrush core and then mm. you know save save some money together and yeah. buy the full version of zbrush yeah it, it's 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 really a well worth investment also this is something they might not do in the future but every single version of zbrush has ever been free uh, like I, I bought zbrush like 2008 or something <laughs> yeah. i've never paid for a single version of upgrades after that it's crazy it's ridiculous yeah and then after ZBrush, you need a main 3D software. You need mm. a real, a real <laughs> software. So th this is where this is what we keep call, calling people, people ZBrush cowboys here, because if you only use ZBrush for everything, and you're like, I'm gonna model everything in ZBrush, use use the, the hard surface tools to do everything. You're gonna model a can of coke, and you're doing that in ZBrush, and UVs all that. You need a real 3D software. You need yeah. something like Max or Maya for that. The reason we're, I'm saying only Max and Maya here, and not any others, is these are the ones being used in production. Yeah. Like we, we, we yeah, let's not mention any names. <laughs> but we get a lot of comments about some software. There is there is one software <laughs> which uh, people keep mentioning. Yeah, but you know, there's there's a bunch of really great production softwares that aren't the main tool for yeah. a pipeline. Maya and 3D Studio Max are the main tools for the vast majority of pipelines. Yeah. So getting into Max and Maya, e either or, you know, depending on what you want to go for, is is you know. It's it's definitely needed. Yeah. Like personally, I started out with Max, yeah, what, like here. I don't know, ten, twelve years ago or something, mm. and I used that for about four, four or five years, I think. And then I actually I actually switched to Maya, which was so annoying. Mm. You know, because when you're sw switching from Max, you have your modifier stack. I have access to everything right at hand. Yeah. Switching to Maya was so confusing because there's so much more to learn. But in in my view, because I mean, I've used both tools extensively i haven't i've never used max in a production environment only like a freelance environment mm. but for me maya is definitely the su superior tool yeah. just because it's it's a lot more pipeline integration friendly yeah, and um i think max has added support for python scripting i think though. they have yeah they had didn't before so it was, yeah, it the was max awful script. for that it relied on plugins if you didn't have a plugin then you were screwed if yeah. you didn't have a plugin you could do anything with that <laughs> But I mean, those two tools are really, they're super essential. Yeah. Like the, the reason we're like, we're talking about like, let's say there was a tool called Flender. <laughs> oh God. And uh, like, and there are, there are a bunch of people talking about this. So in Moto as well, uh, Flender, uh, Moto, Cinema 40, these tools here. They're not, and Do you mean Flodo? <laughs> Flodo. <laughs> and Flinema Flordi. <laughs> Flodini. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> so uh, these tools aren't, use as main tools and then there are yeah but there are exceptions here yeah but do you want to learn a tool which is used in ex with exceptions you want to learn the main rule here yeah. you don't want to you don't want to rely on something which is used by like three four studios no so max or maya it's just really you know giving you the most bang for your buck yeah. so to speak um well not not like like figured. not financially not financially because <laughs> obviously flender is uh, free um but you know you have a student versions of Maya and Max and stuff, so it's all good. Yeah. Um, it's just what is going to get you the furthest in terms of you know being hireable. Yeah. And those those two are really those two are really essential. Yeah, they are. And then we move on to texturing. Mm. Texturing is something that it's actually got really fun over the last few years. When I, when I started with three D texturing was. Like, it just sucked to do. It was uh, body paint 3D, body paint. <laughs> which, I mean, it's, it's a fun software. And it's, I think it's integrated into the Cinema 4D today. Oh, and cool. it's, it's a really fun little thing here, but it's just not at all up to date. Mm. And then you had uh, Photoshop. And you, pay, you did do UVs and you painted in Photoshop. Yeah. And there wasn't really anything else out there. And then Mari came along. And now Painter as well, Substance Painter. And these are fantastic tools. They're, they're a bit different in what they'll be used for. For hard surface texturing, I would use Substance Painter for this. Mm. Because you have smart materials, smart masks, all these kind of things. Just yeah. drag and drop and you have a basis. Not a final result, but a basis. Yeah. You have something you can use. And then you have Mari, which doesn't give you anything for free. <laughs> you have to tell it exactly what it is you want to do. But if you know what it is you want to do, it's awesome. So we, we talked about the differences there before. Mm. And uh, we talked to the foundry about that as well. And it's like, it's <laughs> Mari is not a smart software. No. Substance is a smart software, yeah. but so Mari really, you know, you can push everything to the limit, to the limit of realism and really yeah. get everything out of it. Whereas 
the substance will give you a lot of things for free, unlike Mari, but you can't really push it to, you know, to the next step. No. And 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 by this we mean if you have to go super close up on a character, mm, mm. you just don't have the texture resolution for that. For for a for film character, you might have a hundred UDMs 4K. Mari can run that fairly smoothly. Painter will die. Like yeah. at first, it doesn't support painting on multiple units, but even if it could, it would it would die. A little disclaimer here: we're gonna get some comments. No, painter totally. So yeah, painter supports it one udem at a time. You can't paint across udems and stuff. That's so the limitation. So it uh, they are just different tools here, yeah. but also they complement each other very they, well. They really do, and for uh, for gaming as well, you most likely won't need no. like the sixty udem of close up <laughs> of the eye, just because that's just not what it's used for. No. Uh, in in film. It, we don't care so much about performance. We care about what is the best possible thing you can yeah. you can do here. In gaming, it's it's so much does it actually run on a PlayStation Four? Yeah, or yeah. You know, for for gaming, you would have a character. Maybe you would have the head separated from the body, so the mm. head would be one udem on its own. Mm. So you can just paint all of that. You would have his clothes be one udem on its yeah. own. So you can paint all of that. You know, so that's not a problem. But when you have a face for a VFX production, which spans 20 UDIMs. Yeah, easy. It's, you know, you can't, it's impossible to do that in, in, in Painter. Yeah. But that's where Painter comes in really handy when it comes to hard surface and gives you an amazing base. Yeah. Um, but really, like, if you, if you want to get into sort of more of a VFX production, it's definitely worth knowing both. Yeah. Because then Mari can help you take your Painter textures to the next level. For sure. Um, this also boils down to one thing we're going to talk about a bit later about observation as well. Mm. When it comes to this, when it comes to texturing, texturing has traditionally been you you do a map and then you plug it into a shader and then you just kind of cross your fingers that this stuff here works. Yeah. The, the more the more new way of looking at this is, which is the way I've been looking at it for the last few years now, is there is no such thing as texturing and shading. It's just surfacing. Mm. What you're doing is just you're just telling a model what happens when light hits here is it shiny is it not shiny what color is it what just what happens to it so if you understand that if you understand how shaders work how you understand like uh, uh, physically based rendering and all that then going between mari and painter isn't that hard because then you're just learning an interface yeah if you're learning texturing and all the principles what is a specular roughness map and all that that's harder but once you understand all this mm then it's really just an interface. We had, um, we've had a chat with uh, a guy we know over from ILM just about the whole, <laughs> kind of called it a, a substance problem mm. in when it comes to people and texturing. Because so before, before substance was really a big thing, people would have to do everything themselves. So either they did everything themselves in Mario or they would do everything themselves in Photoshop. Obviously, you before that, you had something like Quixel mm. and... Uh, DDO, I think it was yeah, called. Yeah, exactly. And those were kind of like precursors to, to Substance. Yeah. And the, But the problem with Substance, I'm going to say problem, is that it's so available, right? So it's so much easier to get into texturing, and it's so easy to rely solely on smart materials. Yeah. And when you rely solely on smart materials, it's just drag and drop, and you really tend to forget about your masks. And your masks are what make your texturing. Yeah. Like being able to produce good masks, I mean, as boring as it sounds, like blending materials properly together, that's what's going to give you that, yeah. like, you're, that's what's going to take your textures to the next level. So I think that's something to really keep in mind when you're doing substance texturing. For sure. It's uh, like we're talking, this is a character talk here, but but characters also have hard surface props. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not that, well, you can only do naked dudes. Like, it, it's everything here. So exactly what Morton is saying here, you have you have to kind of like a grenade canister or something like that on a character, and then you just go, well, curvature masks, and now it has yeah. the same amount of breakup everywhere. Yeah. But that's not how, how stuff works. Stuff is, stuff is very diverse in, yeah. in, in nature. I mean, Substance can do a lot of things and it gives you a lot of stuff for free. You know, you yeah. can seem some particle stuff on top of things and for sure. the curvatures can give you scratches in the right places. And but, it's awesome. Yeah, but there is just a limitation to it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, the limitation is just if you if you really just, you, you don't take it further than that. Yeah. If you just, smart material, awesome, I'm good now, <laughs> then you're in trouble. Yeah. And then uh, that was a quick little substance painter rant. <laughs> <laughs> the, our rant here is it's so good that it's easy to be lazy. <laughs> I think that's the important takeaway that, I mean, I love substance. Yeah. I love substance designer and I love substance painter. 
we aren't really covering designer no. here, but you know, if it's something that if you want to supplement, you know, start making your own smart materials and stuff, you could definitely look into substance designer as well. One tool which is also worth learning if you want to be a mm. character artist is Marvelous Designer. This is one which I honestly haven't got around to yet, mm. and that is, I have no excuse. <laughs> 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 I should really learn Marvelous Designer. To um, live with someone who knows it a little bit. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I have no excuse here. But the point about Marvelous Designer is that if you want to be a character artist, it turns out a lot of, a lot of stuff has clothing on it. Yeah. And most characters do. Most characters do. The reason I haven't learned is because I've been mostly doing creatures, and yeah. most creatures don't. don't. Yeah. But if you imagine if, that, like someone like giant monster, like Godzilla walking down the street with like <laughs> yeah. a perfectly same t-shirt, cocky on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to purely do creatures, you can. I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Hmm. Like the xenomorph didn't really have a t-shirt on, so that's awesome. Which was a shame. Yeah, you should have. <laughs> <laughs> Spring break. <laughs> <laughs> but most, most characters will. So if you want to do clothing, the best option is Marvelous Designer. Yes. I've had some people ask, uh, should I learn, should I, should I skip Marvelous Designer in the beginning, learn the core principles of it? There are no core principles of clothing. It's Marvelous Designer. There is no... Well, I guess there's, there's like a garment, uh, what do you call it? Like studying garments and studying yeah, yeah, exactly. like, um, tailor stuff. But by itself, yeah, yeah, that's not really going to do no. anything. So like, it's more like, is there a different way in 3D? Like you should learn to sculpt it beforehand. And sculpting clothing is miserable. It's it's terrible to do. It's There's definitely something to be said for the challenge when you sculpt a naked Greek slash Roman dude with like sure. a little penis cloth or something. Um, it can be an awesome challenge and yeah. you can... You make the fabric look more sculptural. Yes. Um, if you wanted to cheat it, you could probably just sim in Marvelous to yeah. speed it up. But, you know, that obviously that's not the challenge. No. Marvelous is just a superior tool when yeah. it comes to fabrics. Uh, cl- um, design. Like hands down, there was no dispute here. I don't even... Is there... I don't. I mean, you know, I, like end cloth and stuff, mo- oh, model yeah, stuff, yeah, and then yeah. similar like bespoke software. N- like. But yeah, like the, the, there is no alternative to it. The alternative is sculpted by hand. Yeah, and it, that sucks. That, that is terrible. It's, there, there's some things. Mm, no, I was about to lie. No, that's <laughs> no. There now, there's no reason to not learn Marvel. It's like no. the, the thing about Marvelous is that the <laughs> the return on investment here mm. is amazing. Yeah, it takes couple hours to learn marvelous designer as a software it's so so simple to get into the tricky part is figuring out how to cut your garments properly Mm. that takes some time obviously it's like any any craft there's a reason why everyone's not tailors and are amazing at being (laughs) tailors and seamstresses you know but for the amount of time and effort you put into marvelous the results that you can get out it just far outweigh any time you would spend on it Mm. so and it's, I mean, I enjoy it. I think it's super fun to design. You know, you can design the your, your own clothes for your characters. Mm. So it makes it super fun. I think you have a really good point about the return on investment here. In order, to, So you have a full character here, and it takes you like four years to learn the sculpting. And it takes you like a few weeks to learn the clothing. Yeah. And the clothing has been shown way more than the sculpture in this case. That's true. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, and like the, enti- the amount of time that you put into learning Marvelous is also, you know, it just, it pays off in yeah. the end. Um, I've, I, I, I got into Marvelous some years ago before I really started using it in production. Mm. And then I started using it in production and it's just, it's just awesome. I mean, nothing really changes when you use it in production versus when you just use it yourself. Yeah. There are some pipeline things you can do, but it's overall Marvelous Designer is a really simple software. It does one thing and it does it phenomenally. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the core principles because mm. this was um, this was a nice little chat about tools, learning tools. Uh, the core principles here would really be figure sculpting and anatomy. Uh, uh, we're kind of separating those into like figure sculpting and anatomy, and not just as anatomy for overall thing. I, yeah. I think about anatomy more as a technical part here. It's like the origin and insertion of all the muscles and the more medical side of it. Well, figure sculpting is more just make it look like a natural figure. Mm. The end goal here is to make it look like a natural thing. Your end goal is not to show your sick anatomy skills and you know, all the orders and insertions. That's a that's like a means to an end. Yeah. It really should be you looking at it and you and it just feels like an awesome character. It just looks good. So one of the things that I I like to always emphasize is that it's personally I just believe it's way more important for you to focus on the surface anatomy mm. because 
focusing on the underlying anatomy, yes, can make a difference for uh, when a character is in a certain position and they do something and then there's a muscle underneath the surface muscles that starts to react somehow. Yeah. These are exceptions that you can start to learn, yeah. but as a general rule of thumb, I would say anything that affects the surface directly, your surface anatomy, yeah. that's something that I would focus a lot more on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You have yeah, you have a bunch of muscles underneath, like the pectoralis minor, and, and sure, that is going to affect some stuff here and there, but really spend your time on surface anatomy, which mm -hmm. would be like the general pecs, the muscles of the arm, like the biceps, triceps. Yeah. Um, definitely learn the bony landmarks as well. Uh -huh. like if you, This is something we talk about all the time. If your skeleton isn't working, nothing else is going to be working. Yeah. Uh, and also, one of the things which is just so important when it comes to learning figure sculpting is observation. Mm. We have a whole separate video about this, which is like 40 minutes long or something like that, <laughs> where we just properly go into observation. And we talk about bricks. Yeah, we talk about 20 minutes, I and think. And tiger faces, <laughs> and lion faces and whatnot. It, it's really one of these skills which is which is essential to have. Mm -hmm. If you if you don't know what we're talking about, check out the video. I see this so often that people make these like soft, generic little shapes instead of actually looking at what something looks like. Yeah truly look at reference here truly observe it yeah because one thing is like you you start to produce it from memory mm. then that that's you assuming that you know what it looks like yeah. you don't you really don't i mean that's just uh, whatever thing it might be you don't know what it looks like no exactly then you start observing it and then you start to realize oh so i mean that can be definitely be a good exercise where you try to reproduce it from memory mm. then you observe it afterwards and you go like oh okay yeah these parts were wrong i need to do this but i think that important thing here is like really actually observe because mm. a lot of people will look at something and assume okay i looked at it yeah okay i got the reference thing now yeah. down but then they haven't observed it they haven't they haven't studied what they looked at i think i think that's just so important like my my general opinion here is when i'm starting anything i don't know what it looks like mm. and and i'm always being proven right that i don't know what it looks like the moment I look at reference mm. Uh, particularly if you're doing something advanced, like if you like anything organic. I mean, if you're doing a coffee cup, it's like it's less, it's, it's more forgiving because it, it's a coffee cup. But if you're doing like a tiger or like like something actually hard, yeah. I mean, if you're doing a coffee cup, still look at reference. But um, f particularly for really hard things, mm -hmm. it's one of the biggest mistakes I see that people are not observing. Yeah, like doing figure drawing. Um was one of the things that sort of taught me how to look mm. and really observe. Because when you're doing figure drawing, you have anywhere from five to 30 seconds, maybe a minute yeah. to get, uh, you know, a pose down, get the gesture in there, get the sort of feeling across of whatever the model is, whatever position they're in. And if you have five seconds to do that, you need to be so good at observing and then mm. translating that onto paper immediately. 30 seconds, a little more forgiving, but it's still only 30 seconds. So you gotta, crazy. But that, that really forces you to truly observe. Mm. Because if you just go like, oh, yeah, he's probably his hips like out there. And blah, blah, then it's, it's going to look like, like a bunch of goo. Mm. Yeah, for sure. One of the things you also need as a core core skill here is you need to have some some sense of design here because if it, it's like you could take a picture of a human and it would look like a realistic human, but it might not be an interesting human. No. Because if you want to make it look interesting, it's about costume design and like really understanding how how to get a f certain feeling across here. One of my general favorite references for learning design is Disney movies. Mm. Disney have just fantastic designs like uh, Beauty and the Beast. You have the Beast there. You have uh, from um, uh, Hunchback, Hunchback of Notre Dame. You have just some amazing designs. There's such strong, strong and crazy shapes, good colors, good costume design. It's a really good way of learning that as well. Yeah, they, they Disney employs the design principles in their movies very well. Like they, they yeah. make really good use of them. And obviously, if you were to just fire up a Disney movie, you'd probably be overwhelmed. You'd be like, mm. oh, what to look for, what to look for. Yeah. But, you know, you can break it down into the different design principles. I can't remember all of them. <laughs> like, I don't keep track of them, you know. No. But you have something like, you know, we've talked about it before a little yeah. bit in terms of like shape and contrast. texture, contrast, color, light, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, the rest of them. <laughs> and the other ones. But I think learning some core design principles can really 
it, well, it's it's necessary, yeah. but it helps you really improve on your characters as well. Yeah. It's the whole like, if you want to make some evil characters or something, do something that looks kind of evil. Mm. You know, it's use triangles. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole like use triangles, use evil shapes, blah blah. blah. <laughs> like if you look at, um, uh, I'm so bad with that. The, what's the, what's the evil one in in Sleeping Beauty? I think. Um, Maleficent. Maleficent. Yeah, she's an awesome design. Oh, I love. Her. Obviously push to the extreme of mm. what an evil character would look like but you have I, one thing one one i really like is the um, 101 dalmatians mm, cruel devil yeah even yeah. her name yeah i didn't get that i was a pun <laughs> cruel devil until like two years ago <laughs> like her design just just i mean it just oozes evil mm. right she's oh she's such a bitch <laughs> <laughs> and that's it's perfectly designed for mm. it um, then you have you have the the main characters of that film i don't know their names but the dogs? No, no. <laughs> the man and the woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the main human characters. Mm. Their their features are so soft and likable. Mm. Like the dude with the pipe and like big nose and such a friendly. Yeah, design. really a friendly design. He's like the complete opposite yeah. of, of what makes Cruella Deville a cruel devil. <laughs> you know. So I would yeah highly recommend looking at that. Yeah, they're, they're just fantastic at that. So the way I was I was doing this was straight up studying them, not just looking at it and be like, huh, that's cool, but actually like analyzing them, mm. like, analyzing all the curves and the shapes and the overall volumes. Uh, that was really helpful for me, just to understand that. But it was also, we will talk about this later as well, but there was also a difference between a character artist and a concept artist. Yeah. Don't mistake the two. No. A concept artist is somebody who is... Coming up with concepts. A concept is an idea. What you're talking about here, what we're talking about here, is more production artist, mm. which are which is how do you make something functional? Yeah. When somebody draws the car, we build the car. Yeah, we make sure it's all functional here. So some some resources for learning anatomy and figure art here is um, one of my favorite ones is actually is a site called 3D Scan Store. They mm. sell scans. We've been talking about this before. I think scans are amazing. Yeah. They, um, they show a human without any textures on it, and you can change the lighting yourself. And you just realize how soft everything is. Even if you have some super ripped dude, it's still very soft shapes. Yeah, It's kind of hard to find 3D scanned people in the world around you mm. with no light on <laughs> and no textures and stuff. So yeah. it, 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 it allows you to observe a, a person how they actually are. Mm. You know, it's, it's so like you have subsurface scattering in real life and the sun in your eyes and uh, it's just it's terrible for observation and the photos might be doctored as well they might be photoshopped yeah as well yeah 100 percent. so you really don't know what they look like one thing that that really surprised me when i first started looking at scans for faces was uh, pores mm. and I, i've i've i would do this myself before but pores are crazy deep like if you look at the pores from a scan, you realize that they actually go into your face quite far. Yeah, like they it's do. really deep. So when people do surface detailing, they often tend to just make really a really light pass of, of pores mm. that then makes the skin sort of like I mean if that's the goal to make it fairy tale like and mm. all perfect, then you know, by all means. But pores in real life are actually very, very deep. And they're very different as well. The pores on your cheek is very different from the one mm. on your forehead. Uh, you can't just do pore brush no and uh well you can it's just a bit <laughs> weird it just doesn't have the true feeling to it that's that, that the next again that's again observation yeah if you truly observe what pores look like yeah it's just going to take it to like a higher level here yeah and you can do that with everything when you're sculpting you're sculpting a face and you go okay now it's time to do the pores instead of going sea brush pore brush mm. you go Okay, now let me find some reference of what pores actually look like yeah. in the different areas. Now I'm doing pores for eyes. Yeah. What do pores for eyes look like? For sure. People go crazy when it comes to pores. They assume that's like <laughs> the holy grail of 3D. Yeah. When in reality, if you're looking at the good models, like the good Bernini sculptures, they didn't have pores. Yeah. Because how could you do that in marble? That would be impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then also a good resource as well for anatomy is uh, in ZBrush under Lightbox. There is uh, there's an anatomy model by Ryan Kingsline. Which is pretty decent. Uh, it um, it's all like decimated and nasty, but yeah. it uh, but it has the it has the names and anatomical names for them, and uh, it has a skeleton in it. Mm. And I think that's a really valuable resource. I don't think it's valuable necessarily by itself, uh, but it's really valuable if you have it with the book as well. Yeah, it's good to figure out um, which muscles are where, mm. how they insert, 
and just you know the proportions of the muscles yeah. it's i think it's a female model if i remember yeah, correctly I think so, yeah, just... um, so and i think it includes some fat pads as well mm. which could be quite handy yeah. i found there's a forum i used to be on a lot called cg feedback back in the day mm. and there was a guy that shared a um a university scan of like the university had scanned a person ah. I have that scan somewhere of it's everything. So it's all the muscles, everything and like veins and stuff. It's it's just a lot. It's like it's a lot more detailed than the Ryan mm. Kingsland one. Um, maybe I'll see if I can find it. It'd be cool to look at that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then we also have one of my favorite books is called, uh, well, favorite anatomy books. <laughs> Atlas. <laughs> one of my of, favorite books. <laughs> one of my favorite bedside reading. Atlas of Human Anatomy for the Artist. Uh-huh. This is amazing. It has really good illustration for it. Yeah. And also technical knowledge. But like I said, I think it's, uh, I think the Ryan Kingston model is fantastic with the book, and mm-hmm. I think this book here is fantastic with a three D model, mm-hmm. because otherwise you just it's two D information. I mean, by design, it's a book. <laughs> That's something that we've seen a lot is people studying anatomy from books a hundred percent. Like they forget to actually look at uh, like real things. And again, it's it's hard. Even from a picture, it can be kind of hard. But at least from a picture, you start to get a sense yeah. of how the muscles deform and how they, they sit on the body in 3D space. When you just have a 2D representation of a 3D shape, it can be quite hard to sort of figure it out. It really is. That's why having uh, a ZBrush model, if it's a scan or maybe it's the Ryan King's line one. So you just you, you get a sense of, okay, this yeah. is how it sits on the on the body. It's kind of like having like a schematic for a house. Uh, which is super important because it shows how everything is, but it doesn't give you really a true vision of what a house is going to look no. like. You need an actual 3D model or photos or yeah, whatever yeah. it might be. Because at least my, my brain is terrible at translating 2D images, which has this or muscle has origin from here to insertion there. Yeah. It's really, really hard yeah. to visualize. Like that. it would be impossible for you to truly grasp how the scapular, the shoulder blade sits and protrudes on the body yeah. without trying to like like either seeing like see, looking at in the mirror or you know finding a model or a scan or something it's so tricky yeah and then one one course we would do both doing here is um you have a you have a teacher called scott eaton mm-hmm. he, he's a fantastic anatomy sculptor yeah and he um he has a class which is about anatomy. He has actually two courses. One is uh, one is for learning the technical anatomy, and then one is for figure sculpting. If you can afford to take those, I recommend that. Mm. It's pretty hardcore, but that's also just because anatomy is hardcore. Yeah. It's just a tricky thing to learn. So yeah, I think it was oh man, it's six six years ago. Six or yes, seven. Is, yes, something like that. That I took it. I yeah. remember it's the um, anatomy for artist mm. course. I think I took. I believe it was like two or three months. It was pretty intense. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if this is still his opinion, but I think he said back then that you should be able to do it next to a full-time job. Mm. You can. Yeah. Uh, it's just a lot of information to cram in if you sit in the evening and stuff. It really um, is. So obviously people need uh, a job yeah. to make money and stuff. That's pretty useful. But it is, it, is a, it is a tough course, but I think it's definitely well worth it. Yeah. And then the last point here of learning resources is traditional sculpture. Mm. You have guys here who spend their essentially their entire lives as a sculptor. Yeah. Look at look at that. Look at some of the old masters like Bernini, fantastic stuff. Mm. And then look at some look at go to museums. If you're in London, the VA Museum is mm. amazing. Fantastic. And maybe you find some contemporary sculptors as well. Yeah. Not in terms of modern art, because like that stuff is weird. Yeah. But just in terms of <laughs> Just, just find good sculpt, sculpture and just look at that. I mean, the thing is, they, if they observed because they had to, mm. you know, that's how they made their living. If they made a shitty sculpture, then they weren't gonna get paid. No. <laughs> so observation was one of their key skills. Yeah. And the nice thing about looking at traditional sculpture is that it gives you a, first of all, a lot of it's semi-stylized. Yeah. So like they've boiled it down to like just the basics. That's why they don't have pores. And, you know, even the eye, the eyelids and stuff like that is, is exaggerated on the sculptures to give the sculptures a certain feel. Yeah. But what they do really well as well, really well as well, is uh, posing mm. and just the general weight, how muscles fall, where fat sits, skin yeah. folds. All these kind of things is something that you can really learn from because, yeah. I mean, they've, like Henning said, they observed their entire lives. So it, there's no reason to 
for you to reinvent and to rediscover everything on your own no. when there's like there's a cheat sheet and most museums are are free when it yeah. comes to art so yeah they really just figured it out um you have the advantage of seabrush it means that you can actually make something really really quickly you have undo you have undo <laughs> and you have unlimited material like you don't have yeah. to buy clay or a huge block of stone but the advantage they had is that they didn't have undo and they had one block of stone which means they had to get it right yeah if um if you're just dicking around and doing some weird posing and all that, and you're like, cool, uh, that's perfectly adequate. <laughs> but if Bernina did that, he would have wasted like four years. He <laughs> had to make sure it was perfect. Yeah. Yeah, one row move with your chisel and the finger goes up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when, once, you, once you have a solid understanding of the tools you're using and of the, of the general principles you have to understand, we're just going to take you quickly down through how how to actually make a character like and what what the steps are we are we're going to do a video at some point as well where we actually show this with real 3d models in seabrush and maya and mari and all that mm. just quickly giving an overview but uh, this is just a description <laughs> of what it's like <laughs> so the the steps are the first one is concepting this is where you can have a pre-made concept or you can do your concept yourself you want to be careful with doing a concept yourself just because you most likely aren't very good at it. <laughs> most likely. There, there's a reason that being a concept artist is a job by itself. Yes. And there's a reason they, I mean, there's a reason they exist because that's what they do. Obviously, there are people out there who are amazing at both concepting, yes. doing their own concept sculpts and taking the character through the end. But a lot of people out there focus solely on creating and, and illustrating and doing concepts. So if you find a concept that you really like, there's nothing wrong with reproducing that in 3D. No. I mean, oftentimes if you contact someone who's done a concept, I mean, I've never ever heard of anyone contacting someone be like, hey, can I make your model in 3D? And they go like, no. No. <laughs> they fucking love it. Yeah. And it's, it's awesome because now you're taking someone else's concept that they spend a lot of hours trying to figure out and solve. That sort of like frees you up from mm. spending that time and now you can just get straight into production. For sure. Because otherwise you might spend all your time trying to refine the concept when it, it, it's done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so once you have your, let, let's say you, you're doing, you're not doing your own concept here, you're just sculpting up, then um, it's still concept sculpting, you're still interpreting a 2D drawing into 3D. And this is, you gotta spend proper time on this. This is this gotta be a refined, fairly refined model. This is, this is the model you're gonna read to apologize later on. Mm. If, if this model here is is too ambiguous, it's like, oh, does he have three or four fingers? Or like... <laughs> That's like, very ambiguous. That's <laughs> very ambiguous. <laughs> but also like uh, specifically the shape of the mouth as well. You're going to be suffering because then you don't know how to do topology for this kind of stuff. So make this here as refined as you can. Mm. Essentially, after the concept sculpting, the creativity is done. That's the way, I, at least the way I think of it. You can still refine it afterwards in terms of like, you can add more, you can add... Um, like wrinkles and you can really like sharpen stuff up mm. but from a silhouette point of view and from if you were to blur it a little bit it should if you were to blur the final one a little bit it should look exactly the same as concept sculpt because uh, that that's the way you that's the place to be creative yeah otherwise you have to redo topology uvs maybe a rig has to be updated texture has to be updated it's a real pain in the ass <laughs> if you start being creative after you've done a concept sculpt yeah, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with if you're taking someone else's concept and like reworking it somehow. Maybe you take parts of the concept and go, well, I actually want him to have a bigger face or sure. one lumpy hand or, or <laughs> something, whatever. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. For sure. And then once your, um, once your concept is done, then um, it's time to move on to topology and UVs. Mm. This is where you straight up take your model into Maya or Max and you just re topologize it. This is the way the reason we read topology as a first instead of building the base mesh in Maya is you can be creative. Maya is not a good tool for being creative when it comes to creatures. No, it, no. It's, it's terrible for that. <laughs> so you're separating into two stages. You're separating the design into one stage and the technical aspect into one stage here. And topology is important. If, if you don't have good topology, the rigors will hate you. Yeah. But in terms of where you should spend your time, sculpting is more important because topology is, is a technical skill. And in VFX and gaming today, that's often outsourced just because it's 
it takes time to do, but it's not terribly hard to do. Yeah. If you and look- also, like, a lot of, at least for VFX productions, we used to, we, we use predefined base meshes. Yes. So we don't even touch the topology. No. You know, we have bespoke creatures, yes, then we do topology. Yeah. But that's... If you're doing a human? Th- there are more humans in films. Yes. <laughs> for sure. So, the stuff which is easy to do, but takes time to do, will be automated Mm -hmm. and outsourced. Yeah. So it's like if you, let's say you're a fairly fresh 3D artist, but somebody gives you like, this is the general guide, these are the loops for topology, like by looking at some, at like a good reference, bit of reference, they can probably do that. So it's important, it's important to get it right, but don't spend like 60% of your time on a character doing topology. And then at the topology stage as well, that's also when you do UVs. The best way to learn to do UVs, at least the way I find it to be, is to learn to texture. Uh, because the UVs is essentially the first step in texturing. Let's say you are you have like 30 teeth on a model here. If you if you're if you do your UVs in an inefficient manner, now you're gonna have to texture every single tooth. Mm. If you do it in an efficient manner, you can now texture one tooth yeah. and just get everything across here. There are so many of these examples as well. Let's say you have a, you have like a bottle and you the UVs for this are not straight, they're like bendy which might happen if you just unfold it. It's incredibly hard to get a label on top of this because now you have to compensate for the bendiness of, of the UVs at every single stage here. So learn some texturing here. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you have to become a master texture artist, but just try to texture and figure out how you should uh, texture your model. Yeah, by understanding the workflow when it comes to texturing, You'll you'll just be able to like if you set your if you put yourself in that sh- those, their shoes then it's like well if I make shitty UVs here that's gonna be shitty to texture yeah so you want to make your pretend life as a texture artist as easy as possible yeah that that gives you a good understanding of how Absolutely. to make UVs it's it, you, good UVs are not just non stretchy UVs no <laughs> good UVs is doesn't make sense layout is so important it's so important and it's like there's no straightforward way that's why we can't just sit here and we'll go okay so if you do characters you do layout this way if you do hard no. service you do layout this way it's all very dependent on what you're doing exactly and then once your topology and evs are done then you bring this into seabrush again and so now you have your low res model from maya uh, you subdivide this up to like a few million polys and then you reproject your concepts completely mm-hmm. you clean this up and now you spend a lot of time refining this this is where you you finalize the model yeah the, the model you do now this is what's going to be rendering so make sure everything is super tight here. And um, obviously clean up the projection errors and all that. So uh, once you're done with this, then you have a final model with f- final UVs where you just have to export out maps for this, which usually you would ex- export out the lowest model from ZBrush and um, you would export displacement maps yeah. and just publish this out. This of course depends on a pipeline, but um, in, in VFX, you, you just publish it into the pipeline, so it's not just stored on a desktop somewhere. Like it's, it's, it's stored in like a central repository, yeah. which everyone can access. So rigging can now access this model here and um, just keep it incredibly clean. Even if you're not in a production, I still do this. I still, I still just save it out as like in a published folder, just so I know this model here has the latest topology, latest mm-hmm. UVs, and it fits with ZBrush. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't end up with final, 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 yeah, exactly. that kind of stuff. And if you do make a new final, you just replace the one in, in published. Yeah. Yeah, always keep just one file in published. You can have as many as you want in like a whip folder or something, yeah. but keep the, the published one clean. For sure. And then I also recommend posting your character as well, because in this case, he might be an e, an, in an A or T post, and um, that's not very interesting. No. So uh, post your character up. You can yeah. do this with C-Sphere rigging in um, just in ZBrush. Yeah. Or you can do is an actual rig. I actually prefer to do with a proper rig, mostly because then I can send it to a real animator. <laughs> I, I really, I really take, I really use my animator friend's expertise when it comes to posing, because they just know it so much better than I do. Yeah. So I spend a bit, a little bit more time making sure I have a decent rig. So much easier that that way, because you can just like you just have like nice little hip controllers. Mm-hmm. You can rotate everything, shift the weight quite easily. Yeah, it's super nice. Like if you do the seas for rig, then you can. You know, you, even if, you know, your character has clothes on or whatever, um, using Transpose Master, you can just get it into yeah. the position you want. And with a C-Sphere rig, it's always easy to go back and change things. And if you do have access to an animator, 
which is really handy, mm. then they can really help you perfect the pose. Yeah. Chances are well, 100% likely that they're better at posing than you yeah. <laughs> or us. Well, most likely. Yeah, yeah Caesar rigging is super powerful. We actually yeah. have a video on that as well, which uh, we did some time ago, which I'd completely forgotten until now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, then at this point as well, this is where you've got to start texturing the model. There are, in production, you will start texturing this earlier. You're not going to, most likely not going to wait for the final model to start texturing. So you can work a bit in parallel here. But if you're learning this, I highly recommend waiting until your model is done with this. And the way I would say it's easiest to texture something is make the model as best as the best you can. If you have a really, really solid model, texturing it is I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's significantly easier. Mm. Uh, let's say you're doing a dinosaur, which has all the scales. Everything is modeled in here. You can extract a displacement map for that. You can use that as a mask. Very easily, you can make the, the cavity of, of the scale like brownish, and you can make everything else a different color. And you can just break this up in crazy ways. So really make sure your, your, your model is as decent as it possibly can be. And then once you start texturing as well, export out maps like displacement, curvature, cavity maps. These maps here are just going to help you quite a lot. Uh, you won't be able to take your model up to like 100% or something like that, but you can maybe take it up to like 20, 30%. It's just a nice little base. Nice, you know, get some nice common masks here you can use. And, um, and then you can just start either hand painting it or you can use photo photographic reference for that. Mm. But we'll probably make more videos on specific texturing in the future. Yeah. But one of the things I, I do want to talk about uh, real quick is it seems like most people spend like 80%, 90% time on their color map. And then they convert that to black and white. And now they have a bump map and you invert that or whatever you do. And you have a specular reference map. That's a terrible way of doing it. I really prefer to spend more time on bump map than the color map. Obviously, this depends on the character. But... um. If you, let's say you have the lighting, the final lighting is, is is a nighttime shot. You won't see color. It's it's pretty much black and white, and you have like a blue light on it. Yeah. What you're going to see now is specularity and bump. So, it, particularly if a show or film here is in nighttime, like just don't bother too much with the car with the color map here. The bump map is so important, and you can also use the bump map to create the color map. But you can't really do it the other way. Because when you're making the color map, you're often using like shitty 8-bit images just straight from Google. Uh, this is this is just how texture artists do it. Like you assume you have this like crazy, you went to the zoo and you have like 32-bit <laughs> maps with all the range in the world. Yeah. You actually just go to Google and just find some shitty images and you just project that. So the thing is you can't really use a shitty image of like an elephant as a bump map just because it's just kind of crappy. Yeah. But you can use a really high quality bump in textures or for color. So I highly recommend that you spend a lot of time on your bump map and then your specular, specular map as well. Not saying the color isn't important. I would just say that don't underestimate the importance of a bump map. Yeah, and also when it comes to spec, it's when you look at, if you have access to polarized and cross-polarized images, you'll actually start to realize how much color information spec takes out of your, mm. out of your model. Because there's so much, if you look at a face... So much of it is just pure reflection. Yeah. Like you, you really get washed out a lot. Yeah. Um, so putting the effort into that is well worth it. Yeah, it really is. So I mean, this this kind of sums up most of hmm. of this. Uh, we had some common issues or yeah. common mistakes, but we, I think we kind of covered it. But yeah. let's just reiterate. The two most important ones there is not studying your fundamentals properly. Yes. It's like getting impatient and just jumping into it. I think there's definitely something to be said for, you know, jumping into something and starting it and trying to see what you can do. Yes. But you have to, you know, supplement it with with your fundamentals. Otherwise, it'll just be broken forever. Yeah. And then this one is a big one. Mm. It's using reference. Yeah. And like, okay, listen, guys, listen. You're not like some superhero if you don't use reference. No. It's... Reference is the single most important thing you can make use of when you're, it doesn't matter what you're painting, you're sculpting, you're a program, whatever it is, like using someone, some, using reference that maybe it's from photography or it's another sculpture, you look at traditional sculpture, your you, hand, your hand, an anatomy book, whatever it is, all these things will help your stuff look better. Yeah. Like we mentioned, there's definitely exercises that you should do where you try to not use reference and see what you can come up with yourself just to see, okay, how much information is actually stored in there. Then you compare it to the reference and you see what you've done. 
I've seen a lot of posts online from people going like, yeah, I spent like two hours on this and uh, I didn't use any reference at all. And like, yeah, it looks like crap. Mm. Like you should have used some Why reference. Why didn't you use reference for this? It's there's you moron. I've talked to a lot of people that they perceive the whole reference thing as cheating. Mm. Because if you use cheating, or sorry, if you use reference, then you didn't make it yourself. Mm. That's bullshit. Like, no artist in the world who's made a fantastic thing has never not looked at reference. There's always some reference. There's always some reference stored in your head. There's already always something you get inspired by somewhere. Yeah, where do you think your ideas came from? Exactly. So all of it is reference. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with using reference. There's no. something wrong with not using reference, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a reason we've mentioned this for a third time in yeah, this video yeah, here. Yeah. And it is really because, like, it was a with Marvelous Designer, huge return on investment. Mm -hmm. This is even higher return of investment. Yeah. Like, this isn't even hard. Here, you don't have to learn software. You just Google the thing you want to learn. Yeah. And then, or you want to make, and then you just look at that thing. It's free. <laughs> yeah. and you might not be able to reproduce it perfectly, of course. No. You know, it's a learning process, but it'll definitely bump your, uh, bump your studies up a lot. So cool. We really hope this year has been useful for you guys. Mm. Yeah, thank uh, you so much for watching, for <laughs> listening. Yeah, it's a long one. It's and, a long uh, one, yeah. We cover a lot of stuff here. So we, if you want to become a character artist, we really hope this has been enlightening mm. for you. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks. Thank you.